And the first vintage of Cuvain Madeleine, uh, been born then, 2010. A uh, little bit of trivia, it's called Madeleine because it happens to be uh, the birth year of uh, Mel Pearl, as in, you know, the first part of our winery's name, Pearl Morissette, uh, the birth year of his first granddaughter, whose name is Madeline. To this day, like he was here yesterday, and he was joking that she's going to kill him if any of the other grandchildren receive um, wines named after them. It hasn't happened. Madeline remains alone, but this is where the name Madeline comes from. So, in the process of making that first vintage of Cabernet Franc, what became very obvious is that just like there were so far fewer problems with the Cabernet Franc in the vineyard, there were far fewer challenges with it through fermentation, and what came out of under the hands of somebody that has never touched Cabernet Franc before, but is solely respecting, you know, the principles of how we operate uh, with wine, you know, like non-intervention, the this, the that, you know, structure, texture, balance. For those of you that are, that are here again after a couple of weeks, you're probably getting tired of uh, hearing those three things that are most important for us. You can also ask our winery team how they feel about me repeating it every single day. But structure, texture, balance, purity, eloquence, expressiveness, Cuvée Madeleine 2010, everything in one beautiful, complete package. So that singular Cuvée was enough for us to, uh, or like for Francois at the time, because I wasn't, I wasn't here at this time, to turn his mind completely on the other side and say like, wait one minute, like Cabernet Franc is actually capable of extraordinary things in this place, Niagara. Um, since then, it's uh, certainly Cuvée Madeleine has been like right up there with Cuvée Disneuvien in Chardonnay and with the Riesling Cuvée Black Bowl. And I remember because at that point I was actually buying it and selling it as a sommelier in restaurants. The amount of uh, dumbfounded customers uh, that I had at the time, once I pour them something, I will pour them the model and without telling them what it is and say, oh, not only is this Niagara Red, you know, breaking news, a lot of great uh, wine is being made in Niagara, even in Reds, but it is Cabernet Franc, and guess what? Where is the green pepper? So to that mystery of where is the green pepper, the green pepper actually becomes that methoxypyrazine molecule as the grapes continue ripening enzymatically, uh, polymerizes in a different way and becomes uh, the root of a lot of beautiful floral aspects of, uh, that, of aromas that Cabernet Franc can carry. So depending on the vintage, depending on the vineyards, uh, that green pepper can, you know, as it ripens, will be able to express sometimes like red pepper, cumin. Um, in Chinon, for example, they talk about macerating, uh, macerated raspberries. Uh, here, uh, we call it the simple rose, i.e. like simple rose are these uh, roses that are like wild roses, five petal rose. I call it the Bulgarian rose. Because in another tidbit of trivia, the most famous, uh, one of the most famous essential oils in the world uh, and most pricey is uh, the, like the rose and the Bulgarian rose, where I come from. It's about 40 kilometers away from um, the Valley of the Roses. So that aroma has been ingrained in my head since I was young. And it's, once you have it, it's very easy to see it in the Cabernet Franc's expression, but all of those things, like from raspberries, sometimes people call it like um, peony, um, sometimes lilac, red pepper, cumin, those are all connected to this evil methoxypyrazine that if you do not, and I'm putting evil obviously in quotation marks, that if you don't ripen your grapes, will actually be so prevalent within your taste experience that will not allow you 
uh, it, it would just be like green and weedy beverage that is red in color, not necessarily the best of uh, wine drinking experiences. So 20, sorry, 20, 10 vintages later, well, nine vintages later, because we're 2020 now, we've made Cabernet Francs from all sorts of different um, vineyards, uh, different age on the vines. For those of you that have had the Violette last year, this is one of the lightest Cabernet Francs we've ever done. That was pretty much drinking like juice, but still had that beautiful like peppery note to a wine like the 2012 Madeleine um, or the 2015 that just got bottled and it's going to be released in, well, fingers crossed, in uh, around Christmas. To, and it's, it's actually not a Madeleine, it's Lublier because it's spent five years of aging in barrel. But we're going to talk about it at a further date. Uh, to the wines from um, like some of the Matisses from 15 and 16 have been 100% Cabernet Franc. Um, the eloquence that this great variety has shown in being able to express different kind of vintages with the same amount of um, nuance, with the same amount of transparency, with the same amount of exactitude, speaks of a grape that belongs. And for me, um, I always say that, I can't repeat it enough times, like nature is very good at telling you what belongs as long as you are ready and willing to listen. You know, the fact that Cabernet Franc like you know doesn't need as much work in the vineyard and is doing the work for you is just a result of its higher adaptation to the climactic conditions in the soils of Niagara in comparison to let's say Zinfandel or let's not be excessive uh, I don't know um, what else is there here that it makes no sense Nebbiolo okay um, the fact that the fermenting, like once you have health within the vineyard and a very well adapted plant, this is when the real work of greatness within wine starts. In a place like Niagara, when we're still figuring what belongs and what doesn't, to me it's been very interesting that it's taken us so long to acknowledge the superiority of Cabernet Franc over any other grape variety in the area. Again, why? Because, you know, Cabernet Franc doesn't scream it. You have to go looking for it. Or maybe what, or maybe because um, instead of concentrating into exploring what's possible with Cabernet Franc here, we've used it the way other regions in the world use it. And if you get too caught in that, uh, obviously, like we talked about it last week, you are risking of uh, stepping over greatness that the wine can lead you to if you are only paying attention. Paying attention in wine, whether it's in the vineyard, in the winery, um, like during the bottling, is the one quality that. Um, has like, like it's essential, like paying attention 100% of the time because you will see doors open that you would have never imagined are possible on your own. The wine will show you where to go. And Cabernet Franc spoke that with a very, very clear voice, still speaks it with a very clear voice year in and year out and when the fruit from 19th Street Vineyard, which is the source of the Madeleine, as I was saying, starts rolling in, I kid you not, it's just like when the Riesling rolls in. It's like royalty is in the house. We are even a little bit more careful and, you know, bowing our heads because uh, here are the grapes that are able to express Niagara with a language uh, that is far more detailed and to us far more beautiful than um, 
any of the other grapes that we've worked with. So every single year through them, we are learning um, like things about the nature of wine that are going deeper and deeper into the essence of what is necessary for true greatness. And in my opinion, true greatness cannot exist in a wine from a grape variety, made from a grape variety that is not adapted to the area. You can force it, you can like put it together somehow, but you know, not to over quote Richard Feynman, because I know I mention him every time, but it's very well said, uh, the imagination of men can never rival the imagination of nature. So arguably, what we're trying to do here at Pearl Morissette is to shut up and listen and pay attention to what nature wants to say. And it's saying it exceedingly, exceedingly well um, with the Cabernet Franc, with the Riesling. Obviously with the other ones as well. I don't want to like put them down, but those are ones that there's enough history in the area and there is enough plantations uh, within Niagara itself, you know, not to mention, you know, Prince um, Lake Erie North Shore, that it should be obvious by now that this is what we need to be using to step forward into the world with Cabernet Franc and Riesling. Even the fact that the two of them grow side by side here and produce such extraordinary results is already a statement of the uniqueness of Niagara. Because nowhere else in the world you have like Riesling and Cabernet Franc even close together. While here, it happens every single year. Now, let me check the questions because I went off as I usually do. Where do you see Niagara as far as the world stage currently? And when or on what timeline will it take for us to be commonly regarded as a world-class wine region by the majority of the wine world? In terms of the Cabernet Franc, I always say, if I'm trying to be politically correct, I would say Niagara certainly belongs in the top five regions of the world when Cabernet Franc is, uh, is concerned. If I am to speak uh, what I really think, which happens like 99.9% .9 of the time, I think Niagara Cabernet Franc is on the absolute very top of the pyramid. Much like we've uh, had experiences with the Riesling in Germany, we've had the same experience with Cabernet Franc in France in its ex-spiritual home of Little Loire Valley, um, where we poured for some of the winemakers that I personally, and Francois even um, more so for a longer amount of time, has considered like gods, you know, like they're legends in the making. Um, not in the making, they're established legends. And the resulting, like, sorry, the resulting opinion was, and that's a big thing for a Frenchman to say, we didn't even know that Cabernet Franc is capable of that. What Cabernet Franc has in Niagara that does not exist anywhere else uh, that I've seen are a combination of two very particular things. Here, First and foremost, the density of fruit expression, as well as the spiciness, you know, that Niagara spiciness that I keep talking about, regardless of uh, which variety we're covering, Riesling, Chardonnay, or whatever else, the Niagara spiciness is here, and the fruit just bursts out of the glass. Whether it's gonna be more on the ruby, kind of violet side, like in the violet or in some of them, Madeleines from um, a lighter vintage, like 14, or it's going to be on the inky, like blackberry, very like almost unctuous side, like you have in vintages in 2012, 2015. The 18 that is uh, aging on the other side actually was going to have a lot of that as well. It's like a glorious vintage. Hopefully we don't fuck up the wine, or if we don't um, mess the wine up on its way to bottling, it's still a few years to go. 
um, it, it has that um, extra muscle. It has that extra, like, like it's, it's, a, it's a line that it, if you think of it as a canvas, like all the flavors that Niagara provides, and if all the flavors that Niagara provides are the threads, it's a very tightly knit canvas. While my experience has been that in regions like the Loire, the greatest of wines, which are like truly, truly great, they behave completely differently. They're a little bit more vertical. They're always a little bit more, um, how do you, like their bones are a little bit finer. The wines are always a little bit leaner, even in warm vintages. They don't have that explosiveness of fruit and rarely this amount of um, exotic spiciness that we find here all the time. Alongside that, Cabernet Franc naturally has higher acidity and smoother tannin than Cabernet Sauvignon. That's why the old joke goes that, uh, well, it's not joke, it's reality. In any French bistro, in any bistro in Paris, you will see like people drinking Cabernet Franc, you know, whether it's Chinon, Bourguille, Saint Nicolas de Bourguille, all um, wines made out of Cabernet, made from Cabernet Franc from the Loire Valley that are very, um, you know, drinkable. Uh, high acidity within the wine allows it to uh, pair very well with food. So that is in France, the quintessential uh, bistro wine. And you know, what they say is that they keep the Cabernet Franc for themselves to drink and it's for the Cabernet Sauvignon from, or you know, like the English and the North American palates. Um, the Cabernet Sauvignon being like mostly the Bordeaux blends and so on and so forth. So that high acidity is already, or like higher acidity, because it's definitely not a high, high, high acid grape, but it's higher than Cabernet Sauvignon, allows the wine to flow way more um, elegantly, gracefully um, than a Cabernet Sauvignon or Merlot for that matter. So you have in Niagara this explosiveness of fruit, the richness of um, like just like the whole register of flavor characteristics is very rich, it's very dense, but rather than that producing a wine that tires you down, and um, you cannot drink more than a glass or two from, even in big years, these wines flow. A wine like the 2012 Madeleine, which um, here we call it the 40 year old wine, meaning that it's probably not gonna reach its peak until uh, 40 years from now. It, it's immensely big wine. It's probably like, I forget now whether it was 13.5 or 14% alcohol, but it doesn't tire you. It doesn't um, kind of weigh your palate down. It still has freshness. So that freshness, that richness, and the consistency of Cabernet Front from one year to another in Niagara, regard, and cons like when I talk about consistency, I don't talk about consistency of expression. I talk about consistency of quality are huge, like huge uh, how do you, like markers that we all need to be paying attention to uh, and saying like, we have something world class on our hands. How long like it'll take for people to recognize that? It depends how long it'll take the French to admit that somebody can beat them in their own game in Cabernet Front territory. That's my personal opinion. We'll see. Uh, but a good friend of ours that also works for us a little bit, who happens to be from the Loire, uh, and uh, you know, sommelier, a huge fan of Cabernet Franc. When we first met, he used to say, this is the best Cabernet Franc outside of France. And I said, like, honestly, think again. Like, show me your best example of Cabernet Franc um, in the Loire and let's compare. It took him about, how many years has it been? Probably seven or eight years. But he's admitted that uh, that sort of qualification of outside of France may not be necessary if we are objective observers 
of what is happening in the bottom. I think it's all a matter, you know, for a lot of the world, Canada is still, you know, like Francois jokes, the place with the polar bears and ice wine. Um, I think that over the last few years, people are, especially when, um, with the global warming, um, and the, it's not tragical yet, but there are regions in the world, um, like in more, like more so on the southern parts, whether it's Italy, Portugal, Spain, so on and so forth, that are getting too, too warm to grow any balanced wines. People are struggling with it. Um, it's, it, it, it's really, really heartbreaking. And all of that is happening in a place uh, and at a time where people want to drink fresher and fresher and fresher wines. Um, so everything is changing and Niagara is perfectly positioned to take advantage of that because freshness uh, is, comes naturally to our wines. Um, and as long as we help people get over their bias, one, against Cabernet Franc, uh, and two, not being afraid to say it's like one of the best Cabernet Francs in the world, if you want to be politically correct. I think the louder you are, the, the, like that's why I'm like, I'm not afraid. Like when I go to Europe to make, you know, crazy pronouncements, because you know, in France, they're going to look, look, look down on you anyway. So you may as well give them a reason and be uh, like, stir some shit. Um, like the proof is in the pudding, it's in the bottle. Um, okay, somebody's asking about a rosé. I'm not uh, there yet, but I will answer that question because it is coming. Uh, do you have a recommended year to drink or age the Cap Franc until? So I'm gonna ask, uh, answer that question and because it actually, it's quite, um, it's a good question to start talking about the wines themselves. Just as in any other wine, it depends on the structure that the wine inherently carries. The structure that the wine inherently carries depends on the vintage. So here we have 2013 and 2017. Let's talk about them first. Very similar vintages, 17 being uh, our current release. It just got released about a month or a month and a half ago. It's all a blur now. Um, they're vintages that have a natural harmony within them uh, straight from the get-go. They're not going to be like closing too tightly or opening like all of a sudden. They develop in a very steady way. We like vintages like that because uh, their life in bottle is uh, somewhat predictable, so you don't have to, you know, all of it, because there's vintages like 12 and 16 where life in bottle is not predictable. One day it's singing, the next day it's like it's giving you the middle finger, telling you leave me alone. But the 13s and 17s uh, have, well, the 13th has always been very steady, hence our assumption is that the 17 is gonna go through a similar steady development. Is it close to reaching any sort of peak uh, Cabernet Franc moment yet? Absolutely not. When we release wines here, especially the top ones, it's us saying to you, like the wine is at a place where all the elements are together. The harmony, like the blueprint is there and you can drink it. However, this is only the beginning. So if you wanna experience like the places it'll go, um, give it time, meaning either cellar it or um, decant it for a few hours because pretty much, you know, as we've covered before, what you're doing by decanting is, it's a different kind of like, almost like speeded aging a little bit. You're allowing the wine to ingest as much oxygen as possible, which would happen uh, over time through the cork while the wine sits in bottle. And that oxygen, allows you to look deeper into the core of the wine and to see all these other layers that may not be immediately obvious to you if you are to consume it straight out of the bottle. 
2010 Madeline is the oldest bottle we have and much like um, the, I would say, um, well, the Chardonnay from 09, uh, it's not, it, it's in a beautiful spot. If you have 2010 Madeline, um, I'm not saying it's not gonna go further, it's gonna go like for at least another 15 years, but it's drinking like a song. It's beautiful right now. Then is a vintage that had a, a substantial amount of structure, but not necessarily too much. Um, on the opposite end, you have 2012, which as I mentioned, like again, drinking beautifully, but drinking beautifully because it has so much fruit and people really enjoy that concentration of fruit. However, like just a light years away from showing its true greatness. 13 and 17, um, I would say we're looking at at least 20 years uh, from the time of uh, bottling, which you can, it's generally speaking, two years after the vintage date. So 17 right now, um, I personally am, um, like when I open it, like I'll definitely give it like a few hours on, or an overnight decant, even though if you drink it straight out of the bottle, what you just have to keep in mind, you taste it and you see, like they're standing there, they're not drying out tannins, they're not interfering with your enjoyment of the wine, but if you give it a little bit of time, they'll swoop out even more. So if you are eating that, if you're drinking that with, uh, let's say, of like bloody steak or something like that, that can balance like more present tannin, you can drink it straight out of bottle. Uh, if you want a little bit more, I don't want to qualify it and call it sophisticated experience, but if you want a little bit more nuance within your uh, food and wine combination, just open it prior. Like, as I said, like, it's not like, Earlier you open it, the better. But even if you drink it straight out of bottle, it's not you're not gonna be disappointed. Um, it's very um, the seventeens are just like you know we were talking last week about the reason they're very very pretty wines. They're very perfumed uh, and they have beautiful structures that are present, but they're not as uh, firmly, deeply anchored as the outer vintage 2013. The 2013s are not as pretty, but they're like, they're deeper. So I just, you know, let me just taste the 17. I'm gonna move to the 13. Um, the 2013, when I open it to check it, because I haven't had that wine in a while, my reaction was like, holy shit, this is good. Now, and this is again, you probably get bored of hearing me say this, but I said, because I don't think in the modern world, whether it's in general life or in the wine world, people talk enough about the importance of patience and the enjoyment and riches that like waiting can bring as beautiful as young vibrant wines are and we're gonna have a lot of opportunity to talk about these um, when you start enjoying or drinking wines with age on them you just enter in a completely different universe into a completely different category and you know they're like whether they're offensive wines or wines of like you know fire and passion you understand that in order for you to see uh, that, like that blackberry note that you experienced on the nose when the wine was first uh, released, uh, if you give it time, can be you know the mother of another twenty different notes, and like, that will envelop you. Like that, you can you cannot manufacture that. You cannot. Uh, but th th there's only time. You can never get to a place of that much richness and intricacy by trying to emulate it through your own work and shorten the time um, 
you know, think that you're able to shorten the time that it'll take for you to experience that. Even more importantly, you don't even know where the wine will take you. The 2013 Madeline, it's, um, it's, it's, I'm just smelling it now and without, you know, people that know me know that's how I normally talk, so, but I don't want to sound like too out there. Like, when I don't even have the words to start expressing what I'm experiencing, you know you've entered into a category that is best just felt and like digested through the senses. Um, and I always get in trouble, especially now when we're uploading some of the back vintages on the Black Ball site and Milton RGM is like, can you give me the tasting notes? Can you give me the tasting notes? And for me, it's very important. I just, I can't spew out tasting notes. I, I have to like think it, not feel it through and try to synthesize my experience and vision in the wine of the wine into words. So I am like, it normally takes way longer than it should, uh, but why it takes way longer? It's not because I'm lazy or trying not to do it, but because it's difficult to express um, the nuances of, um, the nuances of uh, beauty and depth that time has brought into the wine. It's difficult to give people context to that. You know, some of you have had those vintages since they were like relatively young wines, but for somebody that's experiencing the 2013 Madeleine like now, um, it's different to give them, it's difficult to give context of the path that this wine has walked and why the harmony that it's showcasing now, it's, um, you know, orders of magnitudes better than how it used to be. It's, uh, you know, I can talk, if you guys are interested, let me know. I can talk about the production techniques of Bovid. They're slightly different, but not really. Uh, because overall, like our production um, vision, it's always to choose the thing that will leave the least imprint on the wine. So while the 2013, was mostly done in a uh, barrique, 10%, uh, yeah, I forget whether it's 10 or 7% of which it was new. The 2017 was done in larger vessels, uh, not these foudre, but like a different kind of foudre that are on the other side of the winery. Um, neither one, like, one of those approaches is the most determinant approach for the way the wine expresses because both of those different techniques have just been well first of all we didn't have the bigger fudra in 2013 so you use what you have uh by 2017 we realized that we preferred looking with bigger fudra so that's where the wine went uh but not like as, like, as i'm saying this is not what makes the difference between those two ones the difference is one vintage related, where the 17 is definitely more aromatic and it'll stay like this as it develops because this just richness of perfume and aromatics are part of its DNA, while the 13 will forever be like deeper rooted and more anchored a little bit, you know, like the 17 has that Bordelais uh, finesse, but it's also got a little bit of a wink. You know, it's still like a little bit nonplussed with its own sophistication. While the 13, it's, you know, it's a wine that knows it's serious. Uh, it's got a completely different mood about it. But honestly, I'm, uh, uh, it's, it's beautiful. How long that, you know, last, again, many, many years. 2000 and after the 2012 and 2016 vintage, um, and I'm talking just like about wines that, vintages that now exist as finished wine. 2013, it's right after them as um, like the one carrying uh, the most profound like structure, like the deeper roots, the deep roots, the bigger bones. So it, it will definitely go for a long, long, long time. And that the richness of fruit, you know, that I was talking, the Niagara richness of fruit, that it's prevalent throughout all the wines um, is uh, showing, not only showing now,
but allowing the wines, these Cabernet Francs, to age um, with a lot more appeal to them than certain others, meaning from um, regions that don't possess that kind of richness. Because the wine's aging, the tannins are smooth, like, you know, polymerizing, smoothening the palate. You have that beautiful freshness that is present here, even in warmer vintages. But generally speaking, if you don't have enough fruit as the wine ages, that primary fruit becomes secondary and like it slowly falls off. So at a certain point, you start experiencing just like secondary and tertiary aromas. There is nothing wrong with that, but it's also not an experience for everyone. Um, while here, the fruit has evolved, but it's certainly not fallen off. And I've seen that happen, you know, because the vintages of Cabernet Franc, if you have them in your cellar, uh, that are um, like showing, you know, how like a little bit more advancement than the 13 would be the 2011. That one is called Persephone. It's just the only time the Madeline was called something else. And the 2014 Madeline. Why they're showing a little bit more uh, evolution is because those are arguably the vintages with the lighter structures. Like it's all climatically related, like 1000%. So um, if you are, if you have all of these in your cellar or some of these in your cellar and you're thinking like, what should I drink? Forget about the 12s, forget about, um, you know, the uh, 13, like, I mean, don't forget about the 13. Because if you want to treat yourself, it's great. But um, choose a 14 and an 11 over a 12 or a 13. Um, I was going to say or 16, but that is actually still behind me. It's a wine that we're going to bottle in the bow, and that's a big one too. Um, so they are, I can pretty much, as, um, as passionate I am about reasoning and also very proud. It's interesting because reasoning, I think, will take a little bit longer to be recognized. You need probably a few decades to pass because it, uh, like, it needs to be established and accepted as a reference worldwide because it's just a slightly inducing cratic proposition. Cabernet Franc, I think, uh, is already doing it and like kicking ass the Yagara Cabernet Franc all over the world because um, what we have here, there is no, there is singularity about its expression, but it's not out there like there is. I don't think there is things out there, but you know what I mean. It's pretty obvious that like when you open a bottle of any like top Cabernet, not Niagara Cabernet Franc, uh, that it's hot on the heels of some of the best in the world. So I hope people just, you know, keep an open mind or taste blind and pronounce themselves on the wine before they know it comes from the other. Okay. Sounds like you're of the opinion that Cap Franc can represent there were almost as strong as Pinot. In Niagara, I think Cabernet Franc can represent uh, terroir uh, better than Pinot. In order to represent terroir, you need to be a grape of transparency. Now, you can think of grape as, of transparency as a grape that, uh, you know, is a lighter grape, but that's not what it actually means. That's not how it actually works. Uh, grape of transparency, it's when um, the grape does not you know, the grapevine itself is not important. It isn't like the grape variety is not important. The plant is important. It is the link between a few things that can, are considered to be making terroir, soils and climate being two of them. Like that's, it, it's the live link. That's what the grape variety is, the grapevine is. Now, the better adapted that plant is, the lesser attention it'll be calling to itself. So, and when you have plants that are very well adapted, they will be uh, like m the most suited ones for expressing the differences that you can see from within a region, from one area to another, 
from one vintage to another. When it comes to red grapes here in Niagara, and Cabernet Franc is, I mean, a lot of people now are starting to debate whether they're actually noble varieties, and it's a very good question, but Cabernet Franc uh, is, has been considered one of the noble varieties like for a long, long time. It's just not the loud, not loud about it, right? And it always gets forgotten for the reasons that I mentioned earlier. But when it comes to Niagara, it is the king and it reigns supreme. Then I would say Yeme is better suited at expressing terroir in Niagara than Pinot is, and then uh, comes Pinot. Um, has will the 2014 get re-released? The 2014 Madeleine, uh, I think there was a small portion of it on the Black Bowl. I don't think they would, they would see any like uh, re-release because the library is very small. But talking about the 2014, uh, this is the 2014, the Cuvée Jean. Let's talk about that because uh, we actually just put, I believe it was 48 bottles or something, or 40 bottles on the Black Bowl yesterday. We actually took uh, all of the library of the restaurant because we have no more library of ours and put it on the Black Bowl site. So if you're interested in, and for those of you that have been with the winery for a while, uh, like they know how rare of a bird John was even at the time of release. It's at 61 cases total production. So those 40 bottles uh, are there for the taking. And that's that, but the only, if here is a black label, um, because people in 2014, we were putting black labels, so with not necessarily any particular function behind them. This is a VQA wine. Uh, the Black Bowl was a, in 2014 was a non VQA wine, and that's why it took a black label. But um, I think we put the black label on the Jean just to differentiate it from the Madeleine. So the difference here is that uh, this. Um, you know, while the Madeleine was fermented and aged in demi nui and in barrel, this has been done exclusively in Fevri, which are these old Georgian uh, clay vessels. We used to have four, now we have two. Over the years, two of them broke. Uh, but it's the only time we've made uh, a red wine in them because we were curious to see what happens. And, uh, let me tell you, that's been a trip. The only reason why we haven't repeated it since is because we haven't had, well, because we broke two of the February, so there's not much space. And because we also haven't had um, Cabernet Franc fruit to spare for experiments. But, so technically speaking, this is a Cabernet Franc that is seen absolutely no oak of any kind uh, during its life. It was fermented uh, in the Quevery as 100% um, whole cluster, um, then uh, pressed, then returned, aged there, and then when uh, was, we decided it's ready for bottling, uh, you know, we just put it in stainless steel tank to sediment it so we don't have to filter, and went into bottle. So if one wine is taken us on a trip, uh, to hell and back, apart from the 2011 Persephone, it would be this. This is a wine that by technical uh, specifications should not exist. It always had exceedingly high PA, uh, which stands for volatile acidity, and it's not necessarily desirable. Uh, it's supposed to um, destabilize the biomolecular matrix of the wine. It can also be uh, quite abrasive on the nose. Uh, abrasive, I mean like un unpleasant to a certain extent. When we had it tested for different, you know, pathogens in yeast, like whether it's breathanomyces, all these things that are not considered to be part of healthy fermentations, fully morally did this wine explode the charts. So if you're just looking at those grapes, at uh, those numbers, you would be thinking, well, this is like vinegar or on the way to vinegar. But just like it's happened before, 
it generally is the case that the ones with the craziest numbers also defy all our assumptions and show exceedingly high stability, like the exact opposite of what you should expect. At the time of making this wine, we had an assistant winemaker here who was uh, like um, very proficient in science, uh, you know, knew his stuff inside out uh, and very sensitive to the wines as well. And I remember him calling me after the wine was moved and like within 24 hours, she's like, you know, because we taste and I was not on the property. He said, Svet, if I haven't seen this with my own eyes and I haven't experienced it through my own palate and somebody told me that this is what happened with this wine, I would be laughing at their face for like, you know, like years to come. I like, it's just what the wine is showing is the exact opposite of what I've been taught in, uh, he, orig he had his education from University of Adelaide in um, Australia. So again, it's that uh, going back to the, be, you know, stay open uh, and follow the wine and trust the numbers, but only like trust the numbers, but trust the wine more. Because the wine, if the numbers are crazy, but the wine is showing you it's stable, that just means that uh, we as scientists haven't developed processes with which to understand what is going on yet. That's what it means. Like science is there for, to elucidate, but it's not the answer to all questions and definitely not in wine. Nobody really understands fully like the gazillion millions like of processes that go into wine and make it uh complete and stable and delicious like nobody even knows to this day like how exactly does the process of aging happens we know it's like through oxygen but the exact formulas right? like nobody knows so that's the story i remember when i was writing his description like it, like it's a wine that has uh this like feral Hero or hero, however you said, quality about it, and I don't mean that um, as a smell. I mean it, it. It's wilder than the other ones. Um, it is just uh, it's got a little bit more. If I remember correctly, what I said, it's like howling wolves in the night kind of spirit. Like Madeline's never been a howling wolf at night. Madeline is always like poised, elegant, deep, you know, or very perfumed. It doesn't have that wildness about it the jean um definitely definitely has it big time and now that i'm tasting it it's still there uh but you know it's smoothed out just like the the 13 uh it's showing all sorts of other things that the wine carry like the under layers of nuance and flavor and the um, tannins are very very soft because here again Think about it this way there's no oak tannin of any kind anywhere here while in the other ones you know the oak tannin presence uh is not big at all it's just you know it's kind of the tannins and the other ones are like a braid of the grape tannin and the oak tannin itself and they're so smooth and fine because the grape tannin is wrapped around around the oak tannin but here there's zero oak tannin there so what you're experiencing are like just the purity of the grape tannins, which just generally are always much softer, much smoother um, than uh, a tannin that comes from oak. Okay. Um, I have experienced and fallen in love with the serious inkiness that some vintages of Niagara Cabernet Franc possess. Does that deep inkiness predominantly come from the vintage or extended maceration or a combination of these? Uh, depends how you work. That's a very good question. Uh, in our case, it will be 1000% of the time vintage related. Um, because um, what happens is obviously like, just like any other fruit, depending on the amount of sunshine, rainfall, different temperatures, the fruit will ripen in a different way. You know, the shard, you can't really see it on red grapes, but on white grapes, when there's a lot of sun, 
you see like a, like speckles on them, right? Like that's like the human freckles. Um, red grapes, you can't see them, but I'm sure they're there. Like the concentration of phenolics uh, are, is different and varies from vintage to vintage based on the climactic conditions. Now, if you are not working like that, you're not working for phenolic ripeness, but are working for sugar, uh, that like your grape skins won't be as affected. So the one way to kind of um, make the wine more powerful than the vintage, uh, than, the, than the power that the vintage has given it, is to extend the maceration. It's pretty much what the maceration is. It's like, imagine if you are like steeping a tea bag for like five minutes versus 15 minutes. It's gonna be deeper and like more astringent, the tea. And the same thing, if you have long maceration in a, a lighter vintage, you're gonna deepen the wine, but it's a different kind of depth. Uh, and then if you're extracting that much, you probably uh, are also, I mean, I don't want to extrapolate, but most of the Cabernet Francs that I've seen like that are that extracted, they would also put them in smaller barrels a lot of the time with some new oaks, uh, because while you're extracting, you're like you're extracting color, but you're also extracting tannin. And in order to smooth the tannin, you need to uh, kind of put some makeup on it where the new oak comes in. We don't work like that. In Pearl Morissette wine, when you have inkiness, you can take this to the bank, it's 100% because the vintage was sunny. Like we, we actually don't do, uh, like there's two vintages when we've done maceration and that's post fermentation. And for us, maceration is normally practiced, not normally, always practiced in very light vintages. We're on the exact opposite end of the spectrum. Um, what's your opinion of the Cabernet Franc from the Finger Lakes? I think it's right up there. It, it might, so, Finger Lakes are pretty much the extension of Niagara. We are sitting in like the same soils. We are obviously sharing uh, the same climate. Um, we've had quite a few different winemakers from the Finger Lakes pass through here and um, drop a few bottles and you recognize it right away. You recognize that identity that is the Niagara identity expressed there as well. I haven't been there, so my experience with Finger Lakes Cabernet Franc has only been from the bottles that have been gifted to us. Based from what I'm hearing is that the Finger Lakes is an industry. It's younger than Niagara, and as far as I understand, a few winemakers from Niagara go there uh, just to have like uh, seminars uh, or share experience with the Finger Lakes uh, winemakers themselves. But uh, it, it, there is absolutely no reason for um, the Finger Lakes Cabernet Franc to be any less than Niagara Cabernet Franc. It's, it's like, you know, the Finger Lakes area is a continuation of the Niagara Escarpment. Like we are, we are like the same place. Just, you know, they're obviously slightly warmer there, but it is what it is. Okay, do you guys have any other question? Any other questions? I, I, Obviously, like I'm already way past the hour, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Up, oh, update on the rosé. Give me one second. I will step out of the uh, frame and I'll be right back. So, ladies and gentlemen, breaking news, Roslana 2019, you're the first people to see it. It's half drunk because it was, uh, it was bottled last week. Uh, and yesterday we opened it to see how it's dealing with bottle shock. Even more breaking news, it's, uh, it doesn't have it. So, um, we will, like, I, by the way, like, next Thursday, it's when I'm going to talk about the Roslana. It's not going to be released until the 25th of May. I'm going to start on that newsletter ASAP. I'm going to write out the newsletter and, um, you know, 
the Roslana, after three long years, at least for us, is going to make its entry into the world. Um, and another one, it's not, for those of you that have had the violet before, you might think it is violet because it has the same color label. It is not. Uh, this is a Lemberger blend. It's a completely new um, cuvee for us. This is going to be, uh, these two wines are going to be the how we start the summer. You know, because as I was joking before, who needs a white in the summer? Turns out Pearl Morris said, at Pearl Morris said, we certainly don't. Uh, Rosé and a young, vibrant red, completely, completely new. Uh, very excited about them both. Um, the, I actually just texted Milton the title for the next week's uh, talk, uh, which is uh, energy in wine. Where does energy in wine come from? How is this kind of energy in young wines different than the kind of energy that these um, guys with a little bit of age have? And why does it show in a different way? Um, as well as, um, you know, we, for the first time, these are, as I call them, the whiz kids of uh, class 2019. Uh, obviously very young wines, but they're also some like that, that's that's their spirit so a lemberger blend and that will allow us to also talk again lemberger who have you heard talk about lemberger in the younger well we certainly started working with it in 2019 and uh found that we don't care that nobody knows what it is and supposedly nobody will buy it uh it is a grape that shows uh, that sort of adaptability that i've just been discussing about the Cabernet Franc. So um, the first year when we did it, we did the Lila that we talked about like a couple of weeks ago, just one ton of grapes. Second year we did it, like 2019, uh, we actually managed to get eight tons of grapes because that's how much we loved uh, working with Lemberger. Uh, and guess what? Like nobody cares that supposedly they cannot pronounce the name it's a delicious wine um, and uh, people absolutely love it. So very excited to introduce that and very excited about um, the Roslana. This year, I don't know whether you can see very well, it's dark, just like our Roses are always dark. Um, and I'm not saying it because that's what you were supposed to say, but I truly believe it's a uh, far better than the original one. The original one was 2016. It's a blend of Pinot, um, Pinot Noir, um, a little bit of Gamay, which that was the combination in the previous um, release. And this one has a little bit of uh, Merlot in it as well. So, you know, very excited about the Wiz Kids. Next week, <coughs> We've actually decided, because uh, I'm so happy that everybody's like tuning in uh, right now in the middle of the day. Um, but uh, we've decided that people, like, let's try and accommodate people, especially now with the province reopening. Um, I imagine a lot of pe more people will be back to work. So we're going to move it uh, to an evening slot. I think we said 8 o'clock. Uh, Prime time is Milton Cohn. Uh, prime time at eight o'clock next week. Um, we're gonna post the schedule uh, like of the next few talks on Instagram. But if you're interested, just watching it. And this is what we'll be covering: the Prince of Tea, which I mean, I'll tell you the story afterwards. But let's just say, out of five uh, French-speaking people, some of them like true French people. Uh, that were quizzed, only one knew what it means. Turns out it's a very obscure word. This is um, a beautiful word. Uh, we're just trying to express spontaneity because that is a wine of spontaneity. Um, and Francois came up with it. I like it. We'll see whether people can pronounce it or not. Anyway, you don't need to pronounce it in order to enjoy it. And the Roslana, like, we are ready for a wine of rosé and uh, a wine of, uh, sorry, sorry, a summer of rosé and a summer of light red wines. 
because we're releasing no whites for the summer. You know, we don't try to be contrary. It's just the way it happens. You know, you follow the wines and sometimes you don't really have <laughs> whites for the summer. But yeah, this is the update on the rosé. Uh, if you want to know about it, next week, Thursday, I'm going to talk about it at length. And uh, the newsletter will be out on uh, Monday, May 25th. Okay, how age worthy is the 2009 Chardonnay? I just bought a bottle, oof, Vassan. Uh, that is uh, a very, very age worthy wine. Let me put it this way the 2009 has never been actually officially released because um, it was so shut down. It's a very serious wine. Uh, and it was just very shut down for a very long time. The last couple of times when I've had it, it's really like, it's finally like open. It's a very classic wine. This is, you know, Francois says it very well. The 2009, which is only the second year he did Chardonnay here, was when he was done doing Burgundy Chardonnay in Niagara. It's like classic Burgundian techniques in Niagara which classic Burgundian techniques generally tend to structure the wines even more. Um, it's, and, and that of course like slows down its development. Since then, uh, you know, like we've changed our approach where the 2009 has stirring of the leaves and batonnage, uh, no other Chardonnay has that. 2009 has 25% milk, very common thing in Burgundy. Francois chose to do that, not for any other reason, but just because um, like you couldn't access old oak. Uh, so all of these are structuring components that have slowed it down. Uh, it's, it's beautiful. Now, generally speaking, when we have like a winemaker from somewhere like fancy schmancy come and visit, and we're upstairs in the restaurant, uh, we bring out the 2009 and one of the other vintages Chardonnay to show that if you want to do Burgundy in Niagara, you can definitely do Burgundy in Niagara. And also, like FYI, see that 10 years later, the wine shows no signs of premature oxidation or any tiring. But you can also do Niagara in Niagara, which is the rest of our wines. So if you want to drink it, you're in for a treat. If you want to sit on it, sit on it. It ain't going anywhere. So, um, yeah, it's up to you. It's definitely up to you. Well, thank you, everyone. We're on the hour and a half mark. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, like, feel free to... And thank you, by the way, for all the people that emailed me and asking questions. I really appreciate that. I really appreciate, you know, you tuning in. Um, and not that I want to affect your attendance, uh, but just a note that in case you miss it, uh, Milton's actually been um, hopefully editing a little bit. I haven't seen any of the videos yet, but uh, he's been editing them a little bit and putting them on the website under the blog title. So uh, you can go and see the previous ones as well. So, Hope you enjoy the rest of your days. I'm definitely going to enjoy it with those three open bottles. And I uh, hope to see you next week. Thank you.